been to the Lessons Learned Center, um, but I want to um, um, clarify the, the content for today, the fatalities and prescribed fire. I didn't, uh, I didn't um, make it more clear that uh, what I'm going to be talking about, what we're going to be talking about is firefighter uh, fatalities. And it's not just fatalities, but um, because there, you know, there's other types of fatalities uh, involved in prescribed fire, those uh, not participating in it. But today we're going to focus on um, firefighter uh, fatalities related to prescribed fire. Um, and um, we'll be, it, it's obviously a bigger scale than that. But why me? Why, why is Travis talking about this? Um, so I work at the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center. And the, the Lessons Learned Center is, is, is pretty much what it sounds like. Um, <laughs> where we collect uh, lessons related to wildland fire. Um, and it's got a whole history um, about, you know, where it came from and uh, reactions to tragic fire events and stuff like that. But um, the way that we collect these lessons um, is that uh, for the most part, we do it in all kinds of different ways, but for the most part, things happen on fires. The fire service has a pretty good um, uh, culture around um, writing that stuff down, writing reports, uh, tracking that, uh, and and um, and those reports. You know, something happens, usually unexpected. Write down a report, send it to the Lessons Learned Center. We house it. We have a library. You know, you can go and look at uh, uh, reports of all kinds of different events that have occurred. Um, but anyway, when, when that stuff comes in, myself as the analyst, I read those reports and I keep track of certain things, uh, ideally to maybe recognize trends or, or, or see a lesson that is showing up over and over again. Um, and then we try to create curriculum uh, using that stuff and, uh, and, then, and then disseminate it. Um, so that's, that's uh, why why me? Um, and um, and Matt, maybe I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about uh, why you, I do know Matt Carroll. Um, he once chased me with a chainsaw, a running chainsaw. Um, but yeah, Matt, what, I'll let you talk a little bit about uh, just, you know, the, the why Matt part, I guess. <laughs> Thanks, Travis. Um... Uh, I guess I'll have to address that one. Uh, it, the, it did not have a chain on it. It was running, but it didn't have a chain on it. So just uh, for everyone to, to know out there. So uh, why, Matt? Um, I, I'm currently the, the, the assistant fire management officer for an interagency program. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but I sit at a national park and uh, we manage fire on the 37 refuges in 22 parks in the six New England states. Uh, and it's uh, a small program, uh, but we like to think it's mighty. Uh, we do prescribed fire all the way from uh, Connecticut up to the coast, up the coast all the way um, uh, to the Canadian border in, in, uh, on the main border there. So um, I've been doing that uh, for about three years. Uh, but before that, uh, I worked um, for the uh, Forest Service in the wildland, uh, in the Office of Innovation, Organizational Learning, and Human Performance. Um, and in that capacity, uh, I worked to help um, draft and, and put into practice the Coordinated Response Protocol and Learning Review, which is the Chief's Level response to unintended uh, serious accidents. So uh, I did a number of learning reviews, uh, some on prescribed fires and some on wildfires, uh, and uh, took on multiple roles uh, in, in those. And today I'm gonna to be referencing one of those that I did that was a helicopter crash that happened on a prescribed fire in Mississippi. Uh, and so, uh, I'll be using that as a reference and then other other aspects of that job. And then what's interesting is this job uh, really has put into practice a lot of the stuff that I was talking about uh, in more theoretical terms 
when I was doing those line of duty death and uh, reviews and those learning review and coordinating response protocol for the course. So that's me. All right. So yeah, the Amanda talked about the, the mission being, you know, part of what they provide is relevant and credible. And so that's, that's where Matt comes in is he makes all of this stuff uh, relevant and credible. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be the case if it was just, just me here. So, um, so on that, that note, what, what I always want from a presentation is I want folks to be able to walk away with something um, practical, you know, some practical application. And, and we're going to get into that today. Um, you know, I, I, I often um, joke about the Lessons Learned Center changing its name to the Lessons Available Center. Um, because we really, we collect the lessons and then the learning, um, we haven't really figured out how to, uh, how to really influence the learning. Um, so much of that is dependent on the practitioner. So, um, but we can, when we do these types of, of presentations, uh, try to make sure that, that, that the participants walk away with, uh, something very, uh, actionable. And so, um, yeah, in that, in that vein, I was, I was, uh, looking, I did, a Google search of like, oh, hey, I'll, I'll have an image of um, practical application, um, an image that depicts that. And I must have typed wrong and, and typed in impractical application because this came up. This was a, the image result. Um, and uh, based on the, the survey results, there's a few of you uh, that probably know what this is, uh, the, um, the federal uh, application. And uh, um, if, if you're anything like me, the, the first one you filled out was in pencil, uh, and, and, and it actually resulted in me getting a job uh, as a hotshot. Um, that, that probably speaks, uh, reflects more on, on hotshots than it does me. But, um, you know, now being on the, uh, you know, the other side, the hiring side, oftentimes <laughs> this, uh, this form has lots of information. Uh, it's not always the information that I want or need to, to make the decision. That I want, and so hopefully uh, today's presentation um, has uh, doesn't turn out that way. Has uh, some some practical information that you can that you can use, um, and so uh, one one of the the practical things that that we want uh, you to walk away with is is we're hoping to influence um, or entice you <laughs> to have some very deliberate conversations um, with those that you, you um, implement prescribed fire with um, about uh, this board games, just kidding, uh, risk, right? The, all, all of this stuff um, is, is gonna come down to risk and and I think this is this is one of the danger areas that we see in terms of, of um, when we talk about prescribed fire versus uh, wildfire that's not always a, a, a useful way to look at it but it's a, it's a common way to look at it um, and and when oftentimes when we think about risk and prescribed fire uh, we we go directly to um, the risk of an escape, uh, the risk of smoke impacting a community, the risk of um, making our neighbors mad, um, you know, those types of things, those are all definitely risks. Now, today's uh, focus is on the operational risk to the implementers, right? The, um, the firefighters, which is, it's kind of funny to call them firefighters when they're um, hopefully not fighting fire in, in the context of prescribed fire, but um, <clears throat> that, that's the, the risk we want to talk about. And we want to influence that conversation that you're having uh, to include um, a, a, a maybe another, uh, another layer deeper of the operational risk to the actual firefighters. Um, and, and it's, it's real easy for um, prescribed fire proponents um, to um, turn that conversation towards, well, prescribed fire um, it involves less operational risk because it's a planned event. Um, and I understand that intuitive 
um, logic. If, you, if it's planned rather than reactive, obviously it, sh it should involve less risk. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that, that we're going to call into question is, is that approach. And one of the ways that people try to um, um, prove that, I guess, is, oh, well, fewer people die uh, implementing prescribed fire than um, suppression responses to, you know, to, to wildland fires. Now that in itself is true. Uh, the, the number of people that die each year, firefighters, um, is less. Um, now, obviously it doesn't, it's not real tricky to understand like, oh, wait a minute, are, are you, is that a fair comparison and, and all those types of things. And, um, and so it, there's, there's danger in, in that comparison on the operational side um, because there, there are some differences, but the comparisons can get kind of wonky, can kind of start to feel a little bit like this, right? Um, there's, <laughs> it's not exactly apples and oranges, but um, um, y y we can turn it into to that. Um, and, and some of the, the things I like to uh, have people think about in, in this, this context is, um, just bear, boiling it down to the actual operation, right? So we, I can tell you how um, firefighters are hurt and killed uh, on a regular basis. Um, uh, medical emergencies having to do with, um, not always related to, but often related to exertion, right? Um, heart attacks, that kind of stuff. Um, that's, a, that's a common uh, instance on wildland fires. Uh, firefighters, get hurt and killed being hit by trees. Um, they get hurt and killed in uh, vehicle accidents, whether that's engines or even helicopters, as was mentioned earlier, uh, air, aircraft, um, those types of things, and um, getting entrapped, um, you know, overrun by fire. Um, and so those are all things that happen on prescribed fire and those individual operations when you, when you, if we're going to use intuitive reasoning, you know, the tree doesn't care if it's a prescribed fire or a wildfire, right? Um, and, and some of the, the, the logic around, hmm, it's a planned event. It, people will say, ah, oh, you can get out and scout the unit ahead of time and um, identify all the, the danger trees and cut them down if needed. And, um, and while that's true that you can do that, that's not always what happens, partly because uh, cost, right? The cost per acre is a real thing and, um, and, um, and time is a real thing. And, um, and, and even if you did all that stuff, it's not like the risk is, is gone, you know, because those same types of uh, actions take place on on uh, wildfires and and people still get hit by trees so if you if you boil it down to the actual operations that are taking place a lot of the risk um, seems uh, like it's it's just the same and and again we can't really uh, um, boil of that down to numbers partly because we don't have all the numbers needed exactly how many people are out there implementing prescribed fire exactly how many hours they're um, um, out there on the line and the same thing for a while in fire so i would just challenge you to be uh, careful of 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 that perspective that um uh that planned event perspective um and i would challenge you to uh to um, think about if you're going to make that comparison, your ability to respond to a bad thing happening. If the operational risk is is similar, like somebody could get hit by a tree. Um, if, if there's trees there, <laughs> there's a there's there's a chance that somebody could get hit by hit by a tree. If, if anybody's out there exerting themselves, right, there's a chance that somebody's gonna um, have uh, have a medical emergency. So um reevaluating that stuff and that's where sometimes the comparison can be helpful right is um i i haven't been to uh um a wildfire anytime recently 
where there wasn't an ambulance sitting there on, you know, at ICP or at the drop point. And, and, and even if it's not a, a big fire like that, a type four fire dispatch knows, you know, what uh, they have the context, right. And my ability as I see to call somebody that can get an ambulance rolling immediately because they have all the context, they know where my fire is and that kind of stuff. Um, the the capacity to respond to the to the bad event is where um, there's often a lot of difference in in uh, prescribed fire and and wild man fire, um, and so that's another way that I would uh, I would challenge you to to reorient and 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 maybe make that comparison is is what is your capacity to respond and. Um, and what relationships can you build that that could maybe in, increase your capacity to take care of, of firefighters um, uh, in in that regard? And one of the ways we kind of pose this is this question that um, uh, what's where's the proof that what you are doing is worth the risk? And I mean that is a super loaded question, but you know, proof is a hard thing, but on the prescribed fire side, I, I, oftentimes uh, that is, yeah, theoretically, it's a little bit easier, right? Because you're doing, you have an ecological goal that you're after, or you're trying to uh, mitigate danger for a wildfire in an urban interface or something like that. Like there really is something tangible. There, what we're doing is worth something. Now the risk, that, that's hard to, to, to quantify, but it, you definitely can use this kind of stuff to have those conversations. Um, so I'm going to get into some some graphs here, um, and uh, this first one is from uh, incident review summary a few years ago. Um, Self-explanatory there. Um, that's not actually the graph I want to share, but it is actually from our incident review summary. Um, uh, if, if you don't believe me, I'll show you how to to go check it out. Um, so. This is actually what I wanted to show you. Wow, that is not not helpful. Um, I'll have to pause this and fix it. Travis, hey, Matt, you want to cover yeah. some? Yeah. yeah, sure. So, Travis is Matt. Um, just getting back to uh the values piece so me sitting here about to put fire down on the ground uh i've committed i brought resources up from uh delaware water gap uh and then i have another burn going on up at acadia where i brought folks from cape cod national seashores i've driven them on the roads i-95 i've already committed to a a, a whole bunch of risk and uh, just from a human perspective, how much risk am I willing or, or am I willing to accept? And I think importantly, throughout this whole thing, the understanding that that the values that we're managing for and the amount of risk we're willing to accept are both subjective things. And so uh, putting numbers on them we could try very hard through actuarial tables and, and what have you put numbers on, but for, for our line of work and for the decisions that we're making, we're having to weigh those, those judgments. Um, and there's a lot of things that are influencing our appetite for how much we're willing to take. So for me, it's about bringing in the values piece. So bringing in what is the value of what we're doing? And again, it's, there's no magic number. It's not like five is the value. It is really, um, it is the conversation we're having about the values and the amount of risk we're taking. Underlying that are, are trying to be able to discuss how do we bring up those things that are influencing to either take more or less of risk and, and, and our perception of that. So uh, throughout this, and I'm gonna be hitting on this uh, again, but it's, the, the what is more important than actually defining what risk is is the conversations we're having about them that's what's very important to me and i see you, you're back up so go ahead yes i will now demonstrate resilience 
um, yeah, apparently the, the risk of trying to include something funny is uh, sometimes not always uh, worth it. Uh, but maybe you'll at least remember this uh, piece. But you only um, knew that after it. That's the important thing. That's right. We, we only yes, knew that after the outcome, it. right? I, yeah, and I even tested it too. That's uh, yeah, but yeah, it, exactly. You can only look back and say, "Hey, that wasn't worth it." Uh, whereas in my mind, ahead of time, I didn't expect that to happen. I thought it was going to be hilarious. Um, turns out, it was. It kind it was of is, but for the wrong reasons. It was a planned event that that didn't go <laughs> where right. you, that you thought. <laughs> Man, look, it's brilliant. Thank you, uh, Matt, uh, for saving me there again. Um, so um, these numbers, these, these are uh, real numbers, real graph, 25 years of data here, um, talking about entrapment um, by stage of fire. And, and the reason I, I, I use entrapment here um, is because when you think about uh, wildland fires focus um, in terms of curriculum and um, mitigations, all that stuff. So much of our, our, our stuff is focused on entrapments, right? The 10 and the 18, LCES, common denominators. So much of our curriculum is focused on entrapment avoidance. This is this, this big thing. It's not the way that people get, firefighters get uh, hurt and killed most commonly. Um, but it is, it, it is a, it's a big deal and it's a, it's a focus that we have. And it is, it's probably the most, uh, it, it, it is very well documented. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a powerful tool, I feel like. And when I was doing my job as analyst, th this number appeared um, that in, when I was looking specifically at entrapment, that um, very consistently entrapments on prescribed fire account for a 10%, a little bit more than 10% um, consistently. I, I first noticed it on a single year and then uh, started trying to collect more and more information. Um, and that's interesting because like a planned event, right? You're literally looking at the landscape and going, this is how this fire is gonna move across this landscape. And in those instances where we have planned it out, we're still entrapped by fire. Um, and and to me it really illustrates the 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 that risk and the the unknown and and so it it begs the question is is fire just fire and it's going back to the operational risk I was talking about earlier about um, you know once once the fire's on the ground you're dealing with uh, some just the operational uh, risk and you know obviously like, I I ask myself is prescribed fire just ten percent of what we do. Um, that would really support this notion that that fire is fire. So, so given that, um, I feel like that is. Uh, I guess I should mention that you know there are some pretty specific scenarios in that that are 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 common in those entrapments with prescribed fire, and it's usually interior ignitions. As, you know, somebody carrying a torch out. Uh, kind of interior, not always, not only that, but that is a common, you know, specific scenario. Uh, so that might be something that you can, uh, you know, think about, but that's not the only way people are entrapped uh, on prescribed fires. But this whole point is to, to look at this, some of the stuff and, and, and with some of this information and maybe a, a little bit of a shifted perspective on risk, have some conversations um, with the people that, that, that you implement prescribed fire with, and maybe some people that you don't currently implement with, but maybe you should, you know, is the, is the fire department down the road, is that where the ambulance is gonna come from? Do, or do you have relationships with them? Do they know where your, you know, prescribed fire is taking place? You know, it just kind of that comparison to uh, our, our planning, medical emergency planning that goes on, on, on the wild, wildfire response side and, and um, maybe comparing that to your operation. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the idea here is just there, there's some theory um, and then there's some practice, you know, hopefully you're going to go out and have some conversations, maybe do, do stuff a little different. Um, 
and then <laughs> if you depending on on what you practice right you can you can feed that back to the lessons learned center and and help us continue the 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 cycle there's a there's a number of ways that you can um help you know one of them being rapid lesson sharing it's just you know anybody that has a lesson you can um, um, share it with us um, and and you can find that at, at our website there um so that was um i'll get out of the way here and, and let matt uh talk about uh, uh some stuff so go ahead matt right so um I wanted to get back to the piece that I wanted to really focus on was was again building this building the relationships and the and the space the environment that allows for the continuous renegotiation of of acceptable risk. So uh, and, and practically, what does that look like? Um, and I'll start by by giving you a little bit from the the Soto Aviation Incident Learning Review, uh, the helicopter. Uh, was was conducting operations uh, March 30th in 2015 down in um, on the DeSoto National Forest in Wiggins, Mississippi uh, in 2015. And uh, helicopter went down and uh, NTSB never really determined exactly why. Uh, it, it had some sort of hiccup and uh, lost um, lost power to the engine. Uh, I think it was the phrase was catastrophic loss of power went down um seriously injured one killed two and so uh when i went with a team to try and figure out what we could learn from it the the focus really quickly became uh well was because we don't know what happened with the helicopters we can't pick that apart so what's what's the next nearest decision point it was the decision to use helicopters on that aviation or to use helicopters on that incident, on that planned event, on that prescribed fire for that day. So I went through and, and we talked about the values and, and, and how those values may or may not have influenced and, and weighed it against um, the, likely, uh, the likelihood of, of a helicopter going down based on the information that we have. What it came up with, the, the very few numbers, it was a very qualitative um, exercise, but, but the, the few quantitative things that we have is based on the, based on the previous history of helicopters and, and helicopter incidents, and the number of hours they typically, the DeSoto Ranger District typically uses uh, helicopters for their burns, they can expect, they can expect an, a helicopter accident every 85 burning seasons, a fatality every 181 seasons, and a fatality, sorry, a, a fatality accident every 181 seasons, and a fatality every 60 seasons. And the, the 181 is just when there would be uh, um, an accident that involves a fatality, the, the numbers are, are uh, I think the, the important number to look at there is, is every 60 seasons. So every 60 years, they can expect a fatality from helicopters if they use them at the same extent all um, every year. So that's, if you think about it, you know, a 30 plus year career, that's two careers uh, of using aviation. And so when we weigh that and, and what our, our struggle is, was, well, what, how does that help us and what does that mean? Um, and so it's a pretty low number. And, and so then how do we measure that against the values that we have? And, and I can speak to this incident. Um, it was longleaf pine ecosystem. It was restoration for, de for uh, gopher tortoise um, and, and longleaf pine wiregrass ecosystems. It was endangered species. It has all those things that we, we normally talk about. Um, and there's no way to really measure 60 burn seasons per fatality uh, against the, the millions of dollars that we spend bringing people on, building a fire program. Um, and, and what my hope was with this and, and what I'm trying to do now, 
and successfully or not, I'm not sure yet, is, is how, do we, how do we have the conversations? What are the things that we need to be talking about? And how do we bring up those things uh, that are driving our uh, perceptions of the values and perceptions of the, of the hazards that we're exposing people to? Uh, the weighing of them is almost secondary. It's building, it's building the environment so we can talk about it. Um, and so that's my intent was is, is to try and really flesh that out in this DeSoto Aviation accident. Um, but also um, getting back to this practical idea, what does it look like for me now? Um, and I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, I'm a division supervisor trainee, uh, and in my briefings uh, as RXP2, what I attempt to do, and I don't do it well every time, and in fact, uh, the first time I tried it as a division soup trainee, it was not good, didn't, didn't work out well, is after I get through a briefing, try to bring up the fact that, hey, someone could die doing this. And, and although we've made a plan here at the beginning of briefing, or whether it's prescribed fire, we've made a really big plan, and I've spent all morning making phone calls, and we've spent an entire year before this building the burn plan, all that, figuring out all of the ways that we can reduce hazards, there's still a possibility that someone could die today. And for me, the, the, the switch that, 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 has to, that has to happen is, are we, are we prepared to have that uncomfortable conversation, that terrible, really bad conversation with a loved one of someone who just died or got seriously injured? So you can go two ways with that conversation, I think. One is, we never thought this would happen. This is terrible. We, we will, we'll, we'll make sure it never happens again. We're going to learn from this and we'll make sure it never happens again. And I think that's false because of our history. We, it always happens again. And so, and, and the numbers that Travis just said, just said, just showed us, it, it, it is always happening again and it, and it will happen again. So the alternative conversation is we, we tried the best we could to understand what the value of what we did was and the, and the risk we were, or sorry, the hazards we were exposing ourselves to. And we talked through that and we had, we, we tried to provide the best way, the best environment so that we could keep renegotiating whether or not the risk is worth it. And, and up until that point, we, we thought it was, we, we thought we were doing the best we could with that. We thought we were doing good work and we were doing it with the least amount of exposure as we could do. Can we get better at that? Absolutely, all the time. But for me, it, the, the, where it narrows down to is that point where we have to have that conversation with someone uh, who, who just lost someone that was under our command. That's a, it, it, something you never want to think of, but that's where it, that's where it gets really real to me. And that's where I'd rather be able to say we had the conversation about this and we all knew what was going on and, and we thought it was worth it. We knew there was risk. We, we tried to make it as, as least as possible, but we, there was value in what we do. And that is important. And, and it's a not a very comfortable conversation because leadership certainly doesn't like that conversation. Leadership doesn't like us to take any risk. We're supposed to have zero fatality. We're supposed to have uh, we're supposed to have only necessary exposure. And, and what does all that mean? And uh, the, all of these terms are very subjective. And, and so it's very difficult. But ultimately, answering that question to someone that there is value to what we do, we will take risk. And we will expose ourselves to hazards. And it is our job to have the best conversations we can and continue to have those conversations by building relationships, not degrading them, so that we can continue to have those conversations about, is this still worth it? Because we're gonna make a decision in a half hour when the wind changes more out of the south here, I'm gonna make a decision whether to put fire on the ground here. What I need from the people who are working for me and is, is to create the, I need to create the environment so the people working for me right now are able and feel comfortable coming up and saying this doesn't feel worth it or it does 
or however they want to phrase it so we can have that conversation and continue that conversation. If, if I have made a choice and I degrade those relationships in making that choice just to get it done, then I've lost the ability to renegotiate. And the, the, the most important decision about risk management you're ever going to make is always the next one. Because as soon as you make some call, you, uh, you put fire in the ground, you drive out to a, a drop point, whatever it is, as soon as you get out there, things are going to be changing. The environment's going to change. Your perception's going to change. You're going to have lunch or not have lunch. All of these things are going to influence your perception of the environment, your subjective interpretation of it. Uh, and then actual stuff is going to change too. So our ability to renegotiate is super important. Matt, this is really this is really helpful. Um, so what I'm hearing from both of you um, is that we need a shift in the conversations around prescribed fire. Um, it's not just about looking at statistics, but it's really about getting at the human stories behind those. Um, if I may, um, I want to just invite folks to type questions into the chat box. Um, and is it okay if I start off with a with a question going back to one of the slides you had up? Of course. All right. Um, so the entrapments graph, this and this kind of gets at what what you guys have been talking about. Um, in the so in the entrapments graph, um, if, if you don't mind uh, flipping back to that, um, when when you guys did the podcast on entrapments, um, it was suggested uh, during that that uh, entrapments occur more often. Than, than the statistics reflect. Um, and again, this is kind of really getting at the human side behind, uh, you know, what, you know, behind how, how injuries and fatalities occur, both in prescribed and, and wildfire. Um, do you think that prescribed fire might have an added stigma because it's supposed to be super safe? Um, so that, that, so that that little red blip there that's just over 10% might actually be proportionally even higher than the wildfire, um, figures uh, because people might be less likely to report uh, an, an entrapment um, on, on a prescribed fire versus a wildfire? I guess that's, that's a long question, but I'm not asking. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's uh, spot on. Um, that uh, absolutely, you know, obviously our data is contingent uh, upon reporting and entrapments I think are like most things um, <laughs> there's there's a, a whole bunch of them that go unreported and entrapments is specific uh, for for several uh, and, and there's two different points that, that I think you brought up well in there is um, yes the the stigma side yeah it's it's one thing to be you know chasing initial attack trying to fight the dragon and it just got crazy and you got overrun that's almost that's almost acceptable right <laughs> although entrapment uh, does tend to get equated with bad firefighters so there's i think there's a stigma in general about uh about entrapment which i'll talk about a little bit more but prescribed fire there yes there's another added level because you know it's like Really, you did a, you did a prescribed fire and you got entrapped by your own prescribed fire. Like that's another level of stigma. So yes, I would imagine that there's a lot of people um, that would, uh, if it's an option, choose not to report uh, uh, an entrapment um, on a prescribed fire. So yeah, I, I totally feel like that's the, none of these numbers are are you know reflect reality, um, but. Um, the other piece is entrapments in general. <clears throat> um, we have a vested interest in not calling, not always calling an entrapment an entrapment. Right? <laughs> oh, I got, I got cut off, or um, got it. Uh, I had to, I had to duck and weave. You know, we all these, all these little. And when you go back to the the definition, the NWCG definition about your, uh, it basically comes down to if your plan didn't work, <laughs> you know, uh, if your safety zone wasn't big enough, or even if uh, you're, you 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 had to scramble and you were starting to uh, go one direction and you ah you change your mind and um, you found a temporary refuge area, those are all entrapments. But we've come up with all these uh, hedge words. Um, and partly because of that stigma. Um, 
and uh, and you know my myself, I think of the number of times that I've been on tra entrapped by definition, <laughs> including prescribed fires. You know, it's like how many times was I the ignition specialist or uh, the firing boss? I guess these days, and I and I go in to go see if if some some lines came together, and by the time I come back out the situation has completely changed you know maybe it was just the fire or maybe in one instance where somebody else you know dragged a line of fire that completely cut me off and i had to find another way out that's an entrapment i didn't write that down and report it so yeah um thank you for bringing that up and 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 hopefully that makes sense uh, my ramble there yeah that's helpful we have a question that came in in response um from mark he says in prescribed uh, fire where flame heights are under two feet is entrapment really a thing Yeah, I don't, you know, maybe not. If it's if if you're dealing with uh with fire that you can step over, you know, maybe it's uh maybe maybe it's not a thing. Um, and uh, so right, yeah, I, I would I, agree. I, um, you know, we do uh, out east here. We do a lot of burning on the low end just because we're trying to sneak burns in. Um in these very narrow windows and and I'm mobilizing forces from Maine and Pennsylvania to try and get a burn done in Southern Maine or Massachusetts. Um, so we're, we're, we're having to try and com we have to commit a bunch of resources and get out there. And we, there is pressure once you get out there to, to try at least. And so we, we do operate all in the low end and that's not all the time, but it's, it is, it seems to be the case this uh, uh, spring anyway. Um, so, and, and so there's a lot of opportunity for us to just hop over on a field. Uh, and, and I would agree. Yeah, that's, that's not an entrapment. Um, but again, that's, that's only one of the things that, uh, that one of the risks that we face, uh, and, um, you know, the, the sort of exposure from driving and the exposure from exertion and all that sort of stuff still play, um, still play a role. But yeah, it, you know, it's, you're not and, really in trouble if, if you can jump over it. If you can jump over it. And also the, it, you know, that's true as long as, you know, it's, it's the expected, those are the expected flame lengths. And a lot of times that, you know, our planning is based on, like we're actually told, you know, expected. Uh, and, and as soon as for whatever reason, now it's outside the area that you, that you plan for and the flame lengths <laughs> all of a sudden are, are, are greater than what you expected. You know, obviously uh, there's opportunity there. Um, yeah. A follow-up question to that from Bob was, uh, I think entrapments and prescribed fires are in light flashy fuels. No. Um, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's uniformly true because of that, you know, kind of envisioning that, um, interior ignitions type scenario where you're in timber and it's, um, it's not exactly fast moving, but, you know, because you have to get in and light things, you know, pieces can come together and slowly build heat while you're in there trying to get this unburned island going or something like that. So we have multiple instances of, of uh, maybe more like disorientation <laughs> while the fire builds. It's not just light flashies. I mean, light flashies obviously um, are 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 um, prime time opportunity for entrapment, but it's not the only place where that happens. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, other folks, please feel free to type questions into the chat box. Um, so. So Matt raised a good point. So entrapments are key, and this is one part of the story because it this illustrates how the statistics don't necessarily reflect reality. Um, and then Matt mentioned that this is just one of the ways in which people's lives are in danger potentially uh, in a prescribed fire or in a wildfire. Um, I wonder if you could just touch briefly on uh, on in prescribed fire where you have seen. Um, more fatalities or serious injuries occurring, and how that may or may not differ from uh, from wildfire situations. Um, I can say confidently that any way, just about any way that that uh, someone has died operationally on a wildland fire, the same thing has happened on a prescribed fire, right? Um, people have been hit by trees and died people have died operating heavy equipment people have died on entrapments um exertion um the you know heart attacks and driving uh um 
all of those things have happened and the you know fatalities per year hover around you know for uh, for wildland fire they're they're in the mid to high teens you know some uh, 16, 18, there's a bunch of different numbers that I've, I've seen. The ones I have typically are, are somewhere around there, 17 and, and fatalities, um, on prescribed fire are, you know, 1.7 to, you know, depending on how, how long the span is. Um, and, and they, there's the full spectrum of the way that people, uh, uh, people die. I don't know that there's a pattern in terms of, um, you know, this type of firefighter fatality happens on prescribed fire more often. Um, it's just, it, it, it varies. Um, but it does, they, all of the types of, <laughs> um, injuries and fatalities happen. You know, we've had, uh, like fuel geysers and rhabdo. Those are the more recent types of injury type incidents that, uh, um, we've had in, in recent years, those occur on prescribed fire as well. You know, the chainsaw that, that um, has a fuel geyser doesn't know whether or not it's a prescribed fire or um, a wildfire. Got it. Thank you. Let's see. Folks are still welcome to type questions into the chat box, um, but also for, for um, Travis and Matt, if you have questions for everybody, um, you can ask a question and folks can type their answers into the chat box or I could try to create a poll quickly. Um, but if you have a question, feel free to fire away. We'll give folks a moment. I'm always interested in how many people have heard of or used the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, let's see if I can, uh, I don't know if I can make a new, make a poll right now, but I guess just type into the chat box. Um, have you, have you used the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center? Just type yes or no. Um, Something I would add to that is, is how do we move from lessons available to lessons learned? I once made the analogy that the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center is a, um, is a water tower that we have to carry a bucket up and dip a bucket in and bring it all the way back down to, in order to get the learning. How do we, how do we get the learning? What's the way we, we pull all of this amazing resource that is the Wildland Fire Lessons Learning Center and actually turn it into learning? And what does that mean? Travis, you talked about a change in behavior. What is the change in behavior we want to see? For me, it's, it's something to do with, with uh, effective relationships and environment that, that allows for renegotiating that kind of thing. I don't know what the answer is, but that's um, how do we move from lessons available to lessons learned? Yeah, uh, you know, that's a that's the that's the secret sauce right there, right? <laughs> that's the, the thing we're after, and and you know, part of what we're realizing is that learning is takes place locally. You know, like you learn things from the people that you interact with on a regular basis. So how do we get into that cycle of local learning? And every local culture is a little bit different, you know. And so that those are some of the areas that we um, are are uh, looking into at this point is how do we how do we get into that local cycle um, um, and influence what that local learning cycle looks like and so that would be a thing for people to do is, is to have do a a review of like how do you learn locally locally with your people all the people you're involved with how is it that that you share lessons or maybe just information how do you learn um, cause it might be different. Maybe it's, a, a you know, you just sit around the shop and somebody tells stories or whatever. And once you have, once you start to look at it from that zoomed out perspective, how do we learn? Then you can start talking about, okay, how is it that we can influence what it, what is being learned? 
and where are we getting our lessons? Because if you if you restrict yourself to local lessons, you're not using the full uh, spectrum of available lessons. Like, man, there's a lot of lessons that are happening out there in the world that we're collecting at the Lessons Learn Center that that could be um, that could be implemented uh, locally. So. I think we actually have a question that might kind of get at that answer. So someone um, wrote in, um, I'd like to ask the question of how you approach this conversation within your own organization when there are differing perspectives on the risk of prescribed fire at the field level. Matt. I love that one. <laughs> That's a great one. Um, I, I, and I'm, uh, I, I don't have the magic answer, but for me, it's, uh, it's a it's an environment that invites feedback and it's an environment that allows for renegotiation so here's a good example and it's a little bit removed but I'll, I'll get through it quickly at Acadia National Park we had a an adversarial relationship with our natural resources program we wanted to put fire down because and we wanted to do fuels treatments because we would sleep better at night knowing we would have reduced fuels those same fuels were uh, were intact late successional forests that are unique in the in the area how do we come to a common understanding it wasn't about agreeing it was about hearing the other perspective and and that willingness to hear the other perspective not try and drive my viewpoint but trying to understand other viewpoints and create the space and create the relationships focus on the relationships the, the the decisions are always going to be changing. You're always going to have to be making a new call on something. Focus on the relationships, and and that enables you to to renegotiate when the time comes. Practical steps on how to do that. There's probably lots of TED talks I'd imagine about building those kind of things, but building that kind of capacity in your organization. But it begins with you creating the space for feedback, creating the space for people to disagree with you uh, in a respectful way. Got it, thank you. Um, I just wanna point out that time has flown by. We are now one minute before the top of the hour. I know a lot of folks tend to jump off at the top of the hour, but we do have some more questions that came into the chat box. Um, so if it's okay, I'm gonna keep going with those. Um, and if folks need to jump off, uh, you know, thank you very much for joining. Um, we had a question that came in uh, on uh, on a statistic. How many fatalities are involved in the 1990 to 2015 period? It seems like about 12% for prescribed fire is high. Just wondering about the number of incidents. Hey, Amanda, real quick. I've got to jump off because I've got a briefing. Okay. Thank you, Matt. So I appreciate everyone being here. And uh, um, you can disseminate my contact information if anyone wants to follow up with anything. Travis, thanks so much. Thank you, and thank, Matt. You, Take care. And, and thank you, Amanda, for, for putting this together. Very well. Yeah. Very well done. Thank, thank you. you. All right. So for folks that, uh, that can stick around and have a few more questions, uh, Travis, you have a few minutes? Yeah, you bet. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'll just repeat that last question quickly. Um, uh, how many fatalities, I guess, or how many incidents were in the 1990 to 2015 statistics? Because someone thought that the 12% for prescribed fire sounded high. And so the uh, the number of entrapments, I'd have to go back and look. I mean, I, I think, again, remember, this is just entrapments, and this is only reported entrapments. It's not fatalities, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe maybe things got mixed there because the, it, it, it if I heard it right, the question was how many fatalities? Yeah. Uh, we're in. Okay, so that's a whole different um, uh, data set that I'd have to go and look up, but. I can tell you that fatalities on fire events is, you know, if you take 17 times 25, that's, that's the, you know, typically that's what, that's, that's where that uh, number is going to get for those 25 years. And of those, usually one or two per year are um, prescribed, prescribed fire. But um, there's years where there's no fatalities on prescribed fires you know, multiple years. And then we'll have some random year where it just happens to be that there was three fatalities associated with prescribed fire in one year. Um, and that's that, the difference in that long term. And again, I would just um, uh, call attention to the fact that the, the graph I'm showing there is entrapment and, you know, reported entrapments having to do with fire. Yeah. 
Um, another question uh, related to statistics. Uh, someone asked, I recall that some fatalities and med calls have been related to heart attacks and possibly fitness issues. Uh, any differences between wildland and prescribed fire? Um, there's, there's not. I know. Um, I know there's lots of debate because there's <laughs> there are organizations that that have a different. You know what I mean? A different. Um, like you don't have to do the ar arduous pack test uh, to uh, participate in prescribed fire in certain agencies. And I know that that's a man. That is a contested issue. Um, and I don't. I haven't noticed any. You know, real alarming difference. Um, and, and the, to be honest, the majority of the, the, um, kind of focus on the, on the, the, um, heart attacks, it's usually pack test, right? Which isn't, doesn't fall into one of the categories. It's just physical fitness, um, preparing for maybe prescribed fire, maybe wildfire. That's, uh, we've had uh, numerous fatalities. Uh, on that and then there's just fire fatalities that don't happen on a on a fire right it's a volunteer fire department that is um, responding to a grass fire and uh, somebody has a heart attack um, or it's a uh, uh, somebody working um, uh, at ICP or um, as happened several years ago a hot shot hiking from spike camp to the fire line had a heart heart attack um, so it, they're across the board, and there's no discernible difference between um, prescribed fire and, and uh, wildfire. Got it. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I guess a good wrap-up question that'll probably get people going home thinking. Uh, someone wrote in, uh, so I think the big question is, where is the value proposition call in prescribed, for fi in prescribed fire? Is it ever worth risking anyone's life in a sketchy situation for a prescribed fire? Do you think people risk too much now? Yeah, this is this is exactly where you know Matt was talking about. Like, um, um, what's sketchy? You know, sketchy to me is maybe different from the sketchy to 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 somebody else. Um, and that's that. You know, the more you can have the conversation of of what is sketchy <laughs> um, ahead of time, you know, maybe the the more and and be willing to accept somebody else's perspective as as matt talked about and risk is you know there's a, a common phrase that we say hey, risk is personal risk is personal it, it it looks different to different people um and you can't really talk about risk without talking about the benefit what's the payoff um and and that that piece about is it ever worth risking anyone's life um for a, a sketchy situation um you know there's a a common saying of well no no bush is worth dying for no house is worth dying for um yet we get out there and risk it <laughs> like every fire um and and you know so it's a i don't know that it's a black and white answer and we can get all the data and all the graphs and all that stuff and it comes down to um getting out there with a torch and looking at it and um, having done all the planning and having your backup plans and your uh, medical plan in place and uh, and and at some point it comes down to a couple of people nodding their head and going yep it's worth it and and putting fire on the ground because as, as soon as you do that you know it's different now now it's different like like Matt was talking about the next decision is is the most important one so I, I wish I could I wish I could say that and on, on the last part do you think people risk too much now? Absolutely, and people don't risk enough, right? It's a spectrum. <laughs> there's there's people that don't risk nearly enough, and there's people that risk way too much, and we're all on that spectrum. Um, but it's it's really difficult to um, to uh, um, figure out where you are on that spectrum without have without including somebody else's perspective. Um, yeah. You know, leadership's perspective matters. Everybody Absolutely. Knows. Yeah. Um, we did have a comment that comes that came in that echoed pretty much what you said. Um, 
but uh, I feel like that's a, a good note to wrap up on. Um, so just to kind of summarize again, um, as you and Matt were pointing out, we need a shift in conversations around prescribed fire um, and be able to renegotiate the acceptable risk and have these uncomfortable conversations. That's what's going to change these graphs and make them more accurate and better for telling lessons learned and you know lessons lessons to be taught. Um, so that when we go into incidents, uh, prescribed fire, wildfire, um, whatever whatever is coming our way, no matter how much we plan, these statistics happen, um, and there are real people behind them. Um, so thank you, Travis, for all the work you do in capturing these stories and. Uh, helping make them real. Um, we will, this webinar is being recorded and we're definitely gonna send out uh, contact info for Travis and Matt. Um, so if you have follow-up questions, I'm sure there are many great conversations to be had around this topic. So please have the uncomfortable conversations uh, with your coworkers, with your superiors, um, and try to stay safe out there, everybody. Thank you.